We put our energy towards adjusting the external circumstances of our lives. Things come together, they fall apart, they come back together, and so on. And we keep tinkering, but despite our best efforts, there always seems to be unfinished business. And then, someone comes along with a teaching of meditation or dharma, and we meet with a radically different approach to life. We stop trying to fix everything. We turn inwards and start to work with, or play with, perception. And then, everything begins to change. Brought to you by Meditate with Ranga, playing with perception invites you to open to the theater of experience and play. So welcome everyone. I want to start by introducing briefly Bhante Rahula. And um, the introduction I want to give is more about what he means to me. Uh, which perhaps is a bit unique. But growing up in New Jersey, uh, raised as a Buddhist in the Sri Lankan community in New Jersey, I was very familiar with temples and was around uh, our local monks. And most of the time when I would go to a temple, uh, teachings were given in Sinhala, so the, the language of Sri Lankans, which I know very little. And it was rare to hear Dhamma being taught in English and to some degree rare to find teachers who were so focused on the practice of meditation. And I remember being very young one day at the temple and uh, this American monk showed up and uh, his, his Dhamma, his teaching was unique, it was different. It was inspiring, and I saw in him the image of one of the Buddha's children, you know, a real bhikkhu, a real monk. And over the years, he would come every now and then to New Jersey to teach. And so he was one of these figures who helped form an understanding of Dhamma and a deep love for the teaching. So it's really quite a pleasure to see you again after so many years, Bhante Rahala. Welcome. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your invitation and your kind little history of, <laughs> you know, coming into contact with, uh, with the Dhamma. You know, it's, it's always nice to uh, also to teach young people. And I understand very much where the Sri Lankan community and like you are coming from in terms of going to the temples and most of the monks not really uh, knowing that good of English and especially trying to explain the Dhamma, which is, you know, it's not ordinary English language. Sure. So, uh, and also their exposure to Western culture and things like that. And so, uh, you know, I, I could understand, you know, where young people, especially born and brought up in this country, would uh, find it more difficult to try to understand really what is this Buddhism? <laughs> because a lot of times they come to the temple, they see their parents offering flowers and, and uh, offering uh, incense and food to the monks and doing these kind of rituals and they kind of think that that's all there is to uh, you know, the Dhamma. Mm. Or maybe doing five minutes of metta meditation or something. But, and so they you know, didn't get a full appreciation. Right. Yeah, but, absolutely. I mean, just hearing you talk about that reminds me of you know, being a very little kid, growing up in the religion in America, you'd go to a temple and you'd see a monk, and a monk was almost like this alien type of being. Like, who is this person? Why, why, why are they wearing robes? What, you know, what led them to this life? Um, and especially if they don't speak your language, English, then there's even more confusion. Um, but I'm curious to hear from your standpoint. I mean, you you came as a Westerner um, to this thing called Buddhism. I'm curious to hear how, how you encountered the Dhamma. Well, <laughs> the, the very first time, <clears throat> actually, I was on a surfing trip in, in Mexico and coming back up through uh, Tijuana, Mexico and walking along the street. They have a lot of pottery shops that sell all kind of pottery and things like that. And 
I had seen them before, but this one time I, something caught my eye and I looked in, there was a golden statue uh, sitting up above all the black cats and matadors and bulls and other things that you find. Uh, and I didn't know what it was really, but it was just sitting there very serene and I looked at it and it was almost like it was saying, come. Mm. You know? And uh, so I went in there actually and bought it. And I didn't know what, really what it was. Took it home and my mother, who was a school teacher, said, oh, that's a Buddha statue. <laughs> I said, what is that? Who's the Buddha? She, she said, go look it up in the Encyclopedia Britannica. <laughs> so, and that's about the only books available those days, you know, to mm. find out anything. This was 19, uh, you know, 65 or 64 or something like that. Anyway, that was my first exposure. But then there was no place around to learn anything about Buddhism. This was before any temples were here in America or anything. The next time was during a, a world religions class in junior college. And we had to study all the various you know, religions and then write a paper on which one interested us the most. Mm. And I chose Buddhism. Uh, and uh, I don't really know why, but uh, you know, I went to the library, a big library in an American city or well, Riverside, you know, medium size. Uh, but there were only four books on Buddhism in the whole library. But anyway, I read about these general ideas of the Four Noble Truths, karma and rebirth and suffering and about uh, nirvana and meditation, and it sounded, you know, very interesting. Mm. And so I wrote a paper on it, and I got an A-plus on the paper, <laughs> first and last one I ever got. <laughs> but then again, this, that was in 1971, mm. and just after I'd gotten out of Vietnam and uh, uh, was starting to <laughs> regain my life after being in the Army, you know, for three years. Uh, and but there was no still at that time there was no temples or no access to Dharma before the internet you know there was so uh, but I took this course and it you know rekindled a kind of an interest but then I didn't do anything with it because there was no places to practice mm -hmm. so I forgot about it and it was only later when I got to India so a few years later and getting into some serious trouble along the way with uh, drugs and so on, uh, that I was a, uh, I encountered the chance to go to a, a meditation course in Nepal with the oh. uh, Tibetan Lamas. And somebody had told me about that, and I'd been getting, I was staying too stoned, my mind was all clouded, and I really needed to clean it out. So mm. I thought, oh, this is a good chance. So I went to that course. Mm. And, uh, we were hearing lectures and reading these uh, books and meditating, you know, several hours a day, and it was like each time we were meditating and reading something new, it was, you know, something was happening inside, like a, like a pieces of a jigsaw puzzle being put into place, you know. Huh. And it was after a couple of weeks, one night, when it was like the last piece of a jigsaw puzzle put into place, and I just had a powerful experience that just uh, turned my mind completely around, and, you know, uh, all I wanted to do was <laughs> to learn more and practice more meditation and I lost all interest to go back home and lead, lead an ordinary life. Mm. So that's what took me then to Sri Lanka, because mm. people were talking about Sri Lanka being a, still a pristine kind of Buddhist country, and there's meditation centers where I could practice meditation, you could get a visa to stay there a longer time, and mm. you know, people speak English down there because it had been an English you know, colony before. Right. So I went down there and uh, I wound up staying there for you know over five years and uh, mm. wound up becoming a monk there. Wow, yeah, it's quite a story. I want to take a step back to the first thing that you mentioned, and this is something that I still remember as a child. You recounting seeing this statue and how it called to you. How would you explain that? Well, it's difficult to explain. You know, it was just some, the the peace and serenity of it above all the riot of other colors and, and uh, violence, you know, matadors sticking knife into bulls, and mm -hmm. what do you find in Mexico, mm -hmm. and other things. So, I don't know, just, uh, just uh, you know, just sitting above all that and just exuding some kind of peace. Mm. And I guess that's what attracted me to it. But now I understand probably that it was some 
you know, awakening some memory of maybe of a of the past where I, you know, maybe I had been a monk in a previous life or at least mm. knew something about the Dhamma. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it was, uh, you know, kind of trying to <laughs> reawaken that. I don't mm. know. But I took it home. But, uh, you know, I just kept it in my room. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, actually I because I wasn't very religious in those days, so I, I used it as a hat rack to put my straw hat on, and, <laughs> you know, and, uh, but every once in a while I was sitting on my bed and I'd kind of look at the Buddha sitting on the TV and look away, and I, you know, <laughs> but still there was not, no, no, no place to learn anywhere around, mm -hmm. you know, was, mm -hmm. so, uh, yeah, that, so that's the experience with that, and then when I left on my trip ar around the world, uh, my parents wanted to clean out the room, so they put that out in the garden, oh. that statue, when I came back, you know, after uh, many years. Oh, you know, it had kind of disintegrated, you know. Oh, wow. But it's interesting, you know, I think, I find a lot of practitioners, at some point along their story, it feels like something is pulling them along that they can't quite describe, so it's interesting. Yeah, well, even my whole trip to India, I didn't wasn't going to India seeking a guru like a lot of the people did back in the uh, late 60s and right. early 70s. Uh, but at least on the surface, I had heard a lot of stories about the hippie trail, mm -hmm. you know, across Asia and to, to India and Nepal and all the wonderful things happening there by talking to others who had come back. Mm -hmm. So that's what kind of interested me after being in the army for three years, kind of like cooped up in a prison. Mm -hmm. uh, then the freedom of just hitting the road and mm -hmm. following the hippie trail, you know, it was, it was quite exotic uh, idea. Sure. And it was. Right. And, uh, <laughs> so, but once I got to India, I understood that the real reason why I went to India was to encounter the real Dhamma. Mm. See, I, I find that quite interesting. And I do want to spend some time talking about the experience with drugs and the hippie trail because I do find, you know, the youth of America today in, in modernity is very interested in, you know, playing with consciousness to some degree with psychedelics and drugs and alcohol. Um, and I see it more and more. It, you know, a lot of my friends are focused on their career and they're focused on partying. Um, and so even if there is an interest in meditation, it takes it kind of it's hard to fit it in to those two areas so I'm curious to hear I'm actually very curious to understand you know when you think back to your youth at what point did you start to get interested in in drugs and the hippie trail as you call it well it's when uh, you know smoking marijuana and LSD were getting popular in the you know 1966 67 the whole hippie movement hate Ashbury I was in California Mm -hmm. and uh, so on. So uh, I didn't join those, you know, I grew up in San Francisco and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, I was living down in Southern California. But, you know, everybody my age was kind of, you know, experimenting with smoking pot and, and things like that. And then uh, so just, you know, got caught up mm -hmm. in that. But mostly it was for just fun and games, mm -hmm. you know, and getting high. Yeah. It was a good alternative to alcohol. Right. And uh, so it wasn't until later on, and then when I started taking some psychedelics and started experiencing the sort of the mind expanding properties of, mm -hmm. of psychedelics, whether it's magic mushrooms, uh, POT, and LSD, I to started to understand what a powerful thing this mind is. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, and of course, a whole spiritual movement around uh, Timothy Leary and right. Baba Ramdas, uh, uh, how to use psychedelics to, to get some quasi religious experience, mm -hmm. uh, started becoming popular at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, but it wasn't until I went to Nepal, as I mentioned, and took that meditation course, that I started to kind of equate that. And when I actually started meditating, mm -hmm. And then started doing some yoga too. I started to see how you know, meditation and yo uh, yoga can help to bring about this kind of more uh, higher experience, so to speak, without using the drugs. You know, right. you can 
uh, tune in to the deeper layers of consciousness mm. uh, without having the side effects and other problems that the drugs uh, brought along. Right. And I, I want to talk about the psychedelics and, and how that fits into this framework, but what advice would you give to people who their main drug of choice is marijuana um, and they're kind of smoking every day or every other day? And you know, what, what would be your appeal to them to maybe try something like meditation? Well, of course, nowadays it's a lot different because marijuana is legalized and so on. So back in those days, you had to kind of hide it and always be paranoid about, <laughs> you know, getting caught and, and so on. And, uh, and, you know, there weren't many alternatives back in those days, whereas today, you know, there's so many alternatives. Uh, I wouldn't uh, necessarily recommend it because mm-hmm. um, back in those days we didn't, it was all new and there was no guidance on it and, and whereas nowadays there's so much mm-hmm. studies been done on it and the pros and cons and so on but I certainly think it's better than alcohol mm-hmm. so if a person wanted to get high right, and it was the choice between alcohol and smoking pot then probably that would be uh, the better alternative, mm. but uh, you know, not getting too, uh, you know, kind of dependent on it and getting kind of you know, lazy and neglecting your duties, which could is a possibility, uh, you know, if people overindulge in it. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I was a smoker back in my day and a drinker, and I I favored marijuana. Uh, but for me, the thing with smoking weed, like what I found was. I found it to be very numb, you know, and, and sort of like in some ways akin to the movement of the third hindrance of dullness and stagnation and lethargy. It was just sort of like a escape that felt nice, but the more I did it, the more my life seemed to, to be like my heart, my chitta was moved by that direction. I, I felt like it kind of sucked out the wonder of life, the magic of life. And in particular, what I found is that certain emotional elements, like elements of the emotional spectrum, would be lost to me. So if I was smoking weed every day, for example, I wouldn't feel sorrow as much, you know. Uh, but I also wouldn't feel a certain amount of joy. Um, so, yeah, I'm just curious to hear if, if you have any more remarks about that particular drug. And um, Well, I mean, with my, you know, experience, uh, you know, over the years, I, I would say... Uh, meditation is the b- better alternative. Right. Uh, but meditation a little bit takes a little bit longer than smoking a joint in the right. two minutes. You know, you're kind of okay. Uh, so, uh, but uh, meditation leads to a more stable balance, and it. Uh, but some people can also become too addicted to meditation, especially mm. if they get into these very concentrated states where they lose awareness of things around them. Uh, but it's, it's a different type of, uh, you know, experience. Mm. But uh, I would say, uh, you know, of course, experimenting and using that a, a bit. And then, but, but at the same time, I would suggest people that want to, you know, develop their mind or reach a higher state to do it by more natural means, such sure. as having a good diet, and uh, some yogic uh, breathing and exercise, and of course the meditation. Yeah. Uh, because it's uh, one thing; it doesn't cost any much money. Right. You know, pots are very expensive these days. You right. Buy it in dispensaries. I've I've been told. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, I would uh, advise not getting over dependent. Uh, yeah, and oh. and you know, to your point, I find one of. A lot of people that that turn to drugs or alcohol or whatever are sort of looking for some kind of escape, some kind... In a way, they're looking for happiness and joy, I find. And to your point, meditation is a doorway to a very reliable, sustainable, nourishing you know, form of happiness. Because you get high on uh, uh, you know, pot or other drugs, but then you come down. Right. And you, the only way you know how to get there is by using it again and again. Right. Whereas in meditation, of course, you have to keep repeating meditation again and again. But uh, nowadays, of course, uh, you don't have to worry about getting caught so much. But still, it's more natural, and you know there are 
side effects that are being brought out by over overuse of mm. the drugs and and so on, and you can't really control them that that much. Right. Whereas in the meditation, even though it takes longer, it develops a deeper level of stability and clarity of the mind, and it opens up deeper spiritual dimensions. Mm. Uh, that's the main thing. That pot normally doesn't do that. Uh, now other drugs like psilocybin and you know now it's very popular the ayahuasca and, mm -hmm. and they're using them in therapeutic situations and so on and, and so those would provide a deeper spiritual experience in terms of sense of like weakening the the, the boundaries of the ego consciousness and uh, uh, other you know, inhibitions and, and ability to experience more uh, deeper states of awareness Mm. Whereas the pot doesn't necessarily do that, right? And and you mentioned that meditation can open these different dimensions. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that? Well, dimensions in terms of especially the present moment. Now, for me, meditation is about uh, bringing the mind, and, and all kinds of meditation start with concentrating on an object. One of the main purposes of that is to hold the attention in the present moment on on the object that you're either thinking about or you're you're feeling, let's say just the breathing, and you stop uh, thinking so much about the past and the future. Mm -hmm. And so all problems are problems of the past and the future, and most people know nothing about present moment awareness. So in a whole life, we've just been. Uh, you know, the mind constantly going between the past and the future, remembering the past, projecting that into the future with desire or aversion or hatred, and all of our other problems come out of that, and not having any ground, not being grounded. So to me, the meditation, that aspect of meditation was the most important, and to understand that beneath our surface mind in thoughts of eye-centered thoughts and the, just the external world is this parallel dimension of awareness, mm. what I call the ocean of awareness, uh, which is the, the natural state of our consciousness. Mm. And that is sort of the, the real rock or the, the anchor uh, that holds the mind in a deep level of awareness and stability and then you can just observe things going on around you without getting sucked into them so easily like the average person does mm. and uh, you can maintain that if, uh, stay in touch with a subtler vibration of of awareness that's that's connected to the you know, the body mm. so to me that's the most important at least the, the starting point for meditation and that itself brings out these different dimensions uh, levels of consciousness mm. When you say different dimensions, are you speaking about the jhanas? Uh, well, jhanas are just, yeah, you could say dimensions of consciousness. That means less and less uh, mental activity. Mm -hmm. Like even these, this idea of the four jhanas, that's just le you're getting lesser and lesser amounts of mental activity. You're overcoming mm -hmm. the hindrances and you go from one to a deeper level until you go to the very deepest level of stillness. And all those are different vibrations of consciousness. Mm. Uh, and that they eventually transcend the ego state mm. in Can which you have a sense of oneness of being kind of one with everything so to speak mm. rather than just dominated by this sense of a me behind the eyeballs all that kind of disappears in those higher uh, dimensions mm. yeah I'd love to hear a little bit more about this uh, this idea this dimension of oneness you know what's it like to, to dwell in that uh, well, it's, it's hard to explain it. That's why the Buddha, you know, gave the, the steps on how to uh, gradually uh, reach that level. Hmm. But of course, it's not easy, and most people are very impatient, especially Westerners, are used to everything being push a button and get instant, get what you want. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know, to take drugs, right, and then in two or three minutes you're in some state, but. Meditation takes a lot uh, longer to develop, and that's why not everybody has the patience or the time mm. uh, to devote to it, to develop that uh, level of, right. of awareness. 
Right. Yeah. I think that's a, that's a critical point. Um, I think for a lot of folks, when they hear about these different dimensions of being, there's a certain appeal, but there's also distance. Like that feels really far. That feels really difficult. Um, and I'm sure a lot of people will want to know just exactly how difficult is that? Well, that depends on each person. Every person's mind is unique. Mm -hmm. The bodies are unique, you know, as we know. DNA is not two people in the seven billion people that have the same exact DNA, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, so the bodies are different, and the minds are different. Mm -hmm. And so, people are going to respond to different uh, things. Mm -hmm. And there's something involved, what we call karma, too, which means past conditioning that is affecting our ability to uh, to really be free, mm -hmm. and just repeating the same old things over and over and over again, like a you know, a mouse running around in a, you know, one of those uh, wheels uh, chasing its tail. Uh, and um, that's what most people's lives are. They're just caught up in their certain little routines. And uh, they may have some moments of happiness and pleasure, but it's usually dependent on things that they bring in from the outside. Mm -hmm. And so those are always changing and they're not very reliable. Uh, but in meditation, you learn to reach this deeper level of present moment awareness in which the mind gets detached from the automatic reactions and you're more kind of centered mm. uh, and things are going on but you're less reactive mm. and so you can have a you have a few moments to to think do i really need to uh, shout back at that person do i need to flip that person the bird you know do, do i need to to always scratch and itch everything, and you learn how to just watch and observe the things coming in, and that's a very, a very uh, deep level. You know, that's that's how that dimension you reach those what you call dimension of awareness. I like to mm. call it dimensions of awareness. Mm. They're subtler and subtler than just the gross sensory uh, stimulations. Mm. Very interesting. And, and how important do you feel retreat is? to reaching these states? Well, uh, it's a daily practice is what's important. Even retreats are just like a crutch. Mm. Uh, but you, uh, and retreats are like a battery charge. Mm. But if the daily practice, you have to keep up the battery charge. And so if a person who gr gradually develops a daily practice where they're meditating maybe an hour in the morning, an hour in the evening, they know how to practice mindfulness in between and practice what I call M&Ms, uh, and they gradually over a period of time, and I'm not talking one or two months or years, mm -hmm. uh, the mind gradually gets more in tune with this uh, uh, awareness and mm -hmm. less reactive type of awareness and more not the, the needy so much, not needing so much stimulation. Mm. You, know, you can just sit and feel the, the blood pulsing in your arteries or feel the subtle sensations and be quite content just with listening and feeling that subtle life force of present moment awareness in the body. You could sit for hours just to, you know, being absorbed. I mean, that's what jhana is, basically. Mm. You mentioned uh, a couple of words over the last few minutes. You mentioned the, the word vibration and just now life force. Um, I'm one, these are terms that are used in a lot of different sort of new age <clears throat> approaches. I'm wondering if you could add some uh, uh, precision to, to what you mean by these. Well, life force, of course, is uh, a, a yogic term, you know, and prana. So when you study yoga, you hear about the, the prana energy and so on, which is basically, it's like the, the subtle energy uh, electrical energy that keeps the cells of the body alive and it keeps uh, the growth of the body uh, alive mm -hmm. and that's also an, an awareness uh, and I equate it with being because uh, this body basically what is this body made up of you know we 150 pound uh, body but if you break it down it's just billions of cells mm -hmm. if you break the cells down it's just millions of molecules break the molecules down it's just millions of atoms and what are atoms made up of different electrons right mm -hmm. and that's what creates all forms of matter is basically the vibration of these electrons how many mm -hmm. are going around an atom determines whether it's going to be something solid fluid heat motion mm -hmm. what's it's going to 
after millions and millions are accumulated, what's it going to be? A human body, an animal body, a tree, a rock, and so on. You know, through evolution, all this has come about. But it's the life force that basically is, uh, it's aware, I equivalent with uh, awareness itself, mm. that present moment awareness, and it's a spark of life. So this is the foundation of yoga science, mm. you know, which is called the, you know, the, the cosmic awareness for one term or the, and so on. But in yoga, through the, through when you do yoga exercise and when you do deep, slow breathing, you're able to, and you get more centered in the body, you can feel this kind of life force. I mean, you can sit and just feel the whole body being like a Alka-Seltzer tablet dropped in water, you know, just, you know, it's a very, very deep and organic uh, feeling. You know, it's just that it's very, very natural, and the awareness that comes out of that. Mm. Uh, so it's interesting. So you're actually equating awareness and prana or chi. You're saying that they're sort of the same, same thing. Pretty much. Mm. Now, you know, other people are going to maybe argue with me about it, but you know, I don't care to get into arguments. Sure. Uh, you know, we have to keep it fairly simple. I mean, this is talking about something that's very, very profound and deep. Mm. So. Uh, I tend to try to keep it on a very basic, what people can at least uh, have an idea. Oh, yeah, cool. that sounds good. Sure. Check it out. And then as you go deeper and deeper into it, you start understanding the subtler nuances of it. So. Mm. Got it. So, are you describing, so that you're basically describing there's a way to tune into the subtle energy in the body that perhaps most people are not aware yeah, of? Yoga is what, yoga and Tai Chi, these mm. uh, Eastern uh, disciplines, you know. Mm. But in my case, I learned yoga at the same time I started meditating. Mm -hmm. So I didn't really see them as being different things. Mm -hmm. Where now people talk about Buddhist meditation is one thing and yoga is a different thing. I don't really see them necessarily as being that different, mm. uh, at least not in the beginning stages. Mm. Because, uh, you know, the mind operates through the body. Mm. And, uh, you know, if the body is plugged up and the energy isn't flowing, uh, freely in the body or uh, there's lots of pains in the body then that's going to affect your ability to meditate uh -huh. and to get deeper into meditation so the yoga helps to loosen up the body and get the energy moving and uh, and and so when you sit you'll be able to sit more straight and your the meditation will hopefully then proceed much uh, more smoothly Mm. rather than kind of beating your head against the wall or trying to deal with sleepiness, you know, the hindrances of sleepiness and, and uh, you know, ill will and desire and restlessness, always wondering what time is it, what's it, you know, the, the meditation helps to get beneath that, you know, mm. the concentration and awareness uh, to, you know, transcend deeper than those surface gross mm. uh, hindrances. Mm. So that's what you accomplish in meditation practice. The first level of it is learning how to weaken those hindrances through having an appropriate object to concentrate on. And doing yoga exercise and the breathing is, is one way of, of doing that, a very powerful way of initially getting you uh, grounded in the body. Because mm. most people are not grounded in the body, they're just totally spinning around in their, their brains. Mm. And that's what leads to almost all of our accidents and, and problems. Mm. Yeah, I love your emphasis on the body. I, I find it to be one that is, uh, it's something that probably needs more attention. It, I think it's gaining more uh, popularity nowadays in, in Dharma, but um, it is still rare to find meditators giving time to things like Tai Chi or Qigong and yoga. And it's something I've started to implement in, in my practice, but it's curious to see for you from the very beginning, based on your travels, you had both of them. So I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit more about how the two might complement each other. Um, you spoke of how yoga can sort of align the energy in the body to feel more pleasurable and, and allow for a home for, for awareness. Um, I'm curious to hear if, it, if, there's, if there's more to that. I, I had a teacher tell me recently that the Buddha had said that we touch Nibbana through the body, um, which I found to be extremely interesting and, and enigmatic. Um, so I'm curious if you could speak more about the importance of the body. Well, that's a whole Dhamma talk in itself. <laughs> uh, it's because 
our consciousness or awareness is in every cell. So when we were conceived in the womb, in the beginning there was just the one cell organism, and the spark of consciousness has, has come from another uh, source, according to the Buddhist philosophy, like a spark plug that then uh, starts the growth of the body. Mm -hmm. uh, and with each cell division, consciousness goes into every uh, cell as well. Mm -hmm. So we got you know, billions of cells or trillions of cells in the body and they all have awareness mm -hmm. or consciousness because a cell is the smallest unit of, of life. And it has awareness, a very, you know, crude type of awareness. And they're all interconnected in the nervous system because you feel something or something happens on the toe and it sends signals to the brain and the brain sends signals to you know an arm or, or whatever and you know they're all interconnected which I call natural wisdom uh, and it, it was all occurring in the present moment but when the baby's born comes out of the womb and uh, you know the umbilical cord gets cut now it's it's lost that connection to the life force. Yeah. And it has to generate itself. It starts breathing, right? The heartbeat stops, heart pumping, and, and then the, the breathing. And now it's going along on its own. But little by little, it, its mind starts paying attention to the external world. Yeah. People are giving it things, and you know, it's, and so it loses that connection to the body, and to the present moment. And it starts thinking about the past and the future. This is over you know, several year period as the baby's growing up. Mm. And uh, then it never regains that connection to the body. Mm. The only time most people feel the body is when they stub their toe or cut their finger or they're looking in the mirror and combing their hair or whatever. They get sick. Mm. But generally during the day we're just, you know, the whole day from the moment you wake up, oh, got to get to work, got to do this, this, this. The mind is a jump ahead of the body. And that's the cause of so many problems and accidents and why people then get anxious because they're, they've lost that groundedness and that connection to the present moment. So yoga is the way of doing that because mm. when you do yoga exercises, you concentrate on the postures, you're doing deep, slow breathing. It also helps keep your mind uh, uh, you know, focused in the body and also oxygenating the cells. The cells live off the oxygen, right? Mm -hmm. But it's a known fact that most people only breathe one-tenth of their lung capacity. Hmm. And because we don't get much exercise, especially in modern days, sedentary lives and, and, and so on, and uh, people, they're stiff. Hmm. Uh, even young people are stiff. I'm 75 years old, but I'm flexible than most 12-year-old uh, <laughs> kids. Uh, so that means the life force can't flow freely completely through the body and to charge, keep all the chill cells of the body charged up. Mm. And so therefore they suffer on account of that. With pain, m m much pain is because of the energy not flowing through the joints. You know, people are so stiff, and their joints are achy, and it's hard to meditate if your body's sure. full of pain. So by doing yoga exercise in the proper way, getting the life force more moving and so on. And, and our diet also is a very important, you know, uh, because uh, the foods we eat become our body, and we all know that. Uh, so it's a, it's a holistic thing, you know. Mm -hmm. Yoga is a kind of holistic science. But uh, for myself, I prefer the, the Buddhist type of meditation, mm -hmm. my own practice, even though I was learning yoga and Buddhism at the same time. I was using the yoga for the, uh, the bodily, the helps for the body, and the breathing, and the exercises, and so on. But uh, the Buddha's methods of meditation I found more useful mm. than uh, some of the yogic methods uh, mm. that were m primarily just concentration techniques. Mm -hmm. Is there a particular like split of, let's say, like X percent of your time that you would recommend putting towards Buddhist meditation and then maybe a different percentage towards yoga? Is there any recommendation like that? Recommendation is, you know, maybe do uh, 15 or 20 minutes of yoga and then sit for... 40 or 45 minutes mm. or more of meditation. So every sit, every practice would be preceded by a little bit of yoga. That's what I do. Mm, very and in my retreats, I always do that too. Interesting. Not every, but the morning and the evening especially, and other times mm. I'm doing that. Very because it, to me, I don't see it different than the meditation. Right. 
Because Buddhist meditation starts with the four foundations of mindfulness. Mm -hmm. That was the Buddha's main teaching, right? Mm -hmm. On meditation. Right. And it starts with mindfulness of breathing, and then you use the breathing to get the mind to the body, but then the body itself becomes your focus, you know, mm. feeling the sensations in the body. Mm -hmm. You know, seeing the body as just cells and molecules vibrating and, and contemplating the impermanence and change and getting re really uh, grounded in uh, the sensations in the body. Mm. And, uh, and then that leads into the, uh, you know, the uh, Vedana, Vedana Upasana, the other levels of the, the mind, observing the mind. Mm -hmm. and activities of the mind more deeply. Mm. But the body is the gateway. I also call the body as the gateway to the mind. Mm. Yeah, I think that's a very interesting concept that's a little foreign to a lot of Westerners. They think of the mind as just like the brain or something like that. But to feel that, you know, this body is endowed with chitta, like the chitta being the heart and mind is somehow a physical aspect or has a physical aspect, at least for me, has felt very helpful. Um, you know, even just to feel how the mind trembles, you know, when there's fear or is flattened by depression or things of that nature. I well, think. all that affects the body too. Our mm. emotions affect the mind. So the mind affects the body and the body affects the mind. Mm. So we need to balance that. We have to find mm. that balance. And you use each one of those disciplines to help bring that balance. If you're mm. just too much on the body and not enough controlling your thoughts and emotions and things, and you're going to be imbalanced. And if you're mm -hmm. just too much in the mind and you neglect the body, then the body's going to have, maybe have unnecessary problems that is going to make your meditation more uh, difficult. Right. But when you do that together, then, you, you know, uh, you, it helps to make that pro process more smooth. Mm. And what's your recommendation around uh, the field of awareness? You know, there's some teachers who like one-pointed concentration and, and, you know, like, let's say the tip of the nostril, other teachers go for the whole body. Do you have a recommendation there? Uh, well, I follow the, the Buddhist uh, teaching on the four foundations of mindfulness. Mm -hmm. So mindfulness of the breathing helps to bring your mind to the body. Mm -hmm. And whether you're focusing the attention here, so you're breathing air in, and at first thing it strikes here, mm -hmm. or your chest is expanding and contracting. Mm -hmm. you feel that's what I I find more helpful is uh, having people focus and feeling the expanding and contracting sensations in the abdomen, rib cage, and chest mm. because it's a more prominent sensation. It's easier to kind of feel. But anyway, that gets you to the body, mm -hmm. to the outside of the body. Mm -hmm. So normally our mind is floating around there in the external world or lost in its thoughts. Mm -hmm. So first you find the external body. So after mindfulness of the breathing, the Buddha says, when you're sitting, know that you're sitting. Mm -hmm. When you know that you're standing, the four postures. That means you're feeling it. You're feeling the outline of the body. That's how you know you're sitting or standing mm -hmm. or walking. You're feeling the movements and the sensations. Mm -hmm. So the, in, from my point of view, mindfulness isn't, of the breathing isn't to you know, focus here and then get lost in some deeper states of consciousness. It's about... Uh, getting grounded, bringing the attention to the body, and then feeling the, the subtler vibrations of the body and the breathing too. What I call the breathing body. So mm. I use the term breathing body mm. uh, more than just the breathing or just the body. Mm. You feel the breathing body. You really can't separate that. Mm. I mean, you can if you want to, but that's, I don't think that's the way the Buddha saw it. Mm. Uh, and uh, then once you get grounded in the body, then and in seeing, you know, you develop a certain detachment to it too, mm. knowing that it's just impermanent and not using the body. Just, just seeing the body as a vehicle for developing the mind mm. you know, and understanding the purpose of what life is, what this body is useful to. Mm. Uh, and it's a grounding to the present moment because mm -hmm. the body is always in the present moment. So whenever you just remember, sitting, sitting, at that moment the mind is in the present moment. Mm. Uh, but if you don't have that anchor, so I use the breathing body as an anchor to the present moment. Mm. So just like the anchor of a ship, right? Mm -hmm. So if a storm comes, the ship may, you know, uh, move a bit depending on the length of the anchor, right? Mm -hmm. But it's not going to go uh, off crashing into other ships or get 
capsize because of the anchor that's in the ocean floor mm. helps to kind of keep it stable. So in the same way in mindfulness meditation, in vipassana meditation, we, we first develop that anchor to the breathing body. And it could be more just the breathing or it could be more of the body. The body has much more sensations and many more interesting sensations than the breathing does. And it also has other benefits of uh, overcoming pain and so on. But uh, so by you, you turning into those deeper vibrations, what I call vibrations, I, I use the term vibrations a lot, because that's basically what they are. Mm. You hear a sound, what is it? It's a vibration. You can see it on a graph, right? No? Right. <laughs> it's a vibration. Or the electrocardiogram. Right. So uh, I, I use that term quite a bit. Feel the subtler vibrations. Mm. Uh, so when you talk about sound vibrations, even mental vibrations, even mm. our thoughts are like mental vibrations. Mm. Yeah. So it's interesting, Bhante, when you talk about the breathing body, it sounds like mindfulness of breathing, anapanasati, includes feeling the prana, the, the subtle energy of the body. You would sort of include that in that practice. Well, you can or you can exclude. There's different ways mm. of practicing. Like if you focus your attention just here, mm -hmm. you don't fe uh, feel so much of the body because it requires, you get that kind of drawn, it's only a tiny little spot, you know, right. and then people see an emitter of light, for example, mm -hmm. and they want to focus on that, and then sometimes they lose the feeling of the body and so on. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but I, I don't recommend that because... Uh, it's very difficult to do for one thing, and people can't maintain that in their daily life. Mm -hmm. But using the breathing, once you feel the breathing, then you start feeling the sensations uh, coming and going uh, around the breathing. So the breathing is there in the center, but at the same time, you're not getting sucked into a tiny spot, but you're keeping the awareness more open, and you can feel sensations on your face, you can feel some little itchy sensations, and, the, the heart beating or the blood pulsing and you can move your attention down through the body and just feeling all the subtle sensations in the body but the breathing is always there in, in the center to keep a, a certain level of stability mm. so you can be aware of so many things even going on simultaneously and that's what awareness is uh, and that's the beginning of observing impermanence you see how quickly some different sensations are arising and vanishing all over. Mm. And you can notice pleasant uh, uh, sensations, painful sensations, and you see how just this body is just a mass of organic, you know, uh, an organic organism, and you can just sit there and watch it and feel it, you know, and really be grounded in that and feeling subtler and subtler and subtler levels. Mm. Till at some point the feeling of a solid body may disappear. Mm. And you just feel like, you're still feeling the sensations, but it's no longer connected with the idea of, of a body in a certain shape, mm. or even if this body belongs to me. Those are different levels of awareness. Mm. And that's what I mean by different dimensions of awareness. Mm. We're aware of the external world. Then you're aware of just the world of the, uh, the body, mm -hmm. the inner body, feeling the sensations. And then ultimately, if you go deeper and deeper, even uh, the feeling of a body will disappear. Mm. And there'll just be these subtle vibrations, and even sound vibrations and thought movements. Everything is just a vibration, and and that helps to uh, erase the the sense of of me, because the sense of I remains uh, there strong, because of its identification with these various sensations. Mm. in the past and the future, in the memory of these sensations. Mm -hmm. But in the deeper levels of meditation, you're no longer paying attention to these sensations. Mm. Therefore, the past and the present of that sound or that part of the body or that thought no longer registers in the, in the brain. And so you transcend. Actually, meditation transcend is a transcendental meditation. Mm. You're transcending from deeper levels of consciousness to subtler and subtler levels that then become awareness. I make a distinction between consciousness and awareness. Mm. And it's that point when the mind stops letting go of its grasping at everything and fretting and, you know, 
and it reaches that deeper calm level and the sense of the self is not so active and it's more expansive and you can feel so many sensations coming and going without reacting. That's what I call the, the development of awareness. Hmm. Would you describe that as pleasurable? Oh, yes. Hmm. Because it's not thinking in the past or future. Mm-hmm. That's the natural happiness, is present moment awareness. Hmm. Because all unhappiness or unhappiness is dependent on the, remembering the past or future or identifying with yourself. Oh, I'm unhappy. My friend died. Now I'm lonely. Whatever. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. Or the needy. I, I can't get what I want. Mm-hmm. So I have to go out and hurt others to get what I want. Or mm-hmm. Something like that, right? Mm-hmm. So all problems are this, this disconnect from the body, mm-hmm. from the present moment. Can you describe what it might be like, uh, let's say the first time someone starts to enter into these subtle states and lose that real rigid sense of self? It can be scary for people. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of people kind of panic or freak out mm-hmm. because they, they don't know what's happening. Mm-hmm. And they're afraid of the unknown. Like you, it's like a rug being pulled out from underneath your feet. So a lot of people, they, they, they get pulled back too soon mm-hmm. because they can't just relax and go into it. Now, of course, you get used to it once you... That's the problem with the psychedelics. The psychedelics cause these hippies, including myself, to lose a sense of the self too quickly before they really mm. understood what's going on. They freaked out. Mm. Or they, they jumped off a building because they thought they could fly. Right. Or stand in front of a train thinking they could stop a train. Mm. These are stories back in the 60s, sure. you know? Sure. It's because they were deluded. You know, they didn't understand what was happening in their mind, that these were just uh, sensations and not taking them for real. And they all those problems do. Mm. So that's the danger of entering these meditation states without the proper preparation. Mm. Got it. And you you talked about you know going to the army, being a hippie for a while, and then you go to your first sort of retreat meditation center, and you have you described some sort of experience where you said things kind of flipped. Could you talk a little bit more about that experience? You know, it's very difficult to put it into words because it's uh, it happens so f- fast. But as I was saying, each time I heard a lecture by the Lama, it was it was it was interesting. My first meditation course was a one month meditation course. Now here in the states, if you say, "Oh, come to a weekend meditation course," people, say, what? Two days without talking? Two days? Oh my God! You know, right. they worry and fret <laughs> over just a. One day meditation, right. <laughs> but you know somebody said one month meditation. I didn't even think about it. Right. I said, oh, okay, no sweat, let's go. <laughs> Don't think about it. Wow. If you start thinking about it, then you're like I'm freaked out. <laughs> yeah. mm. So anyway, as I was mentioning, each day we hear different lectures on different topics: standard Dhamma, Four Noble Truths, Eightfold Path, Greed, Hatred, and Delusion, Karma, Rebirth, Suffering, mm. and of course meditation, Nirvana, and and so on. Mm-hmm. And so I kind of remembered some of this from my the courses that I took in world religion and so on. Right. And uh, But then we'd have to meditate on it. We, were, we read some certain section of the book and we, uh, we were supposed to sit and meditate and think about it. It was thinking meditation, not so much just trying to quiet your mind, actually. Mm-hmm. You, were, you were thinking about it. And uh, then we would read it in a book. So we had three doses. We'd first hear a lecture or read it in the book then the Lama would give a lecture on that topic, and then we would sit and meditate on that topic. Mm. And this occurred three or four times a day, you know, mm. over a couple of weeks. And so that's what I mean, each with each day or each different time, it was like something was happening, and I couldn't really, it was like having something stuck in your throat, and you're trying to, you know, leach it out, right? And <laughs> finally it comes out, or this idea of the last piece of the jigsaw puzzle, or maybe mm. not the last piece, but at mm. least enough where the, you understand what the picture is, at least mm. to some extent, right? Mm-hmm. So it was like that. Mm. And I even wrote down in my little book, I, was, I had a little journal, and that experience was so, uh, it was during the night, it wasn't even meditation, I was listening to a talk, mm. and uh, it was just like, I went in almost like a mental shock, and I was just thinking to myself, I've been ignorant my whole life. 
Mm. And, uh, and I walked out of the meditation tent at night looking up and I said, you know, beam me up. You know? like, what am I doing here on earth? Something like that, you know. But <laughs> then the, the next day I wrote down in my little booklet, today is the first day of the rest of my life. Wow. Today I'm, I'm reborn. Wow. It was that powerful. That's what I actually wrote down. Wow. It's amazing. And a lot of people have these experiences, but then they kind of wear off and they, and they kind of just, you know, don't really get into it a whole hog, you know, but right. I just, for some reason, I guess it's my past karma or whatever, and, mm -hmm. you know, I, you know, decided, you know, probably become a monk, you know, hmm. and then talking to various monks and Sri Lankan monks and they were encouraging me, yeah, go to Sri Lanka, and there's some nice forest monasteries and, and mm -hmm. there's meditation there, and it's easy to get a visa to stay for, Right. years and so on so on. and would you attribute any of that experience to the talk you were listening to the topic in any way it was accumulation of all of those mm. as I mentioned each talk was like one more piece of a puzzle getting put in I see and that, that, that one particular one was just you know a certain topic I think it was about karma and about all religions lead to the same goal or something. I don't know. I can't even remember mm. clearly. But. And in that moment, did the mind kind of enter into these more... Because you weren't even meditating, as you, as you mentioned. No, it was just like an explosion. <laughs> I didn't um, enter those states, as I mentioned. Uh, wow. What was mentioned earlier. So you're just sort of w awake, listening to something, and then boom, it mm -hmm. just sort of comes. I was very concentrated on what he was saying, you know. Mm -hmm. Right. That's why if you're listening to a Dhamma talk... You know, you're not thinking about other things, sure. you know, because it's so interesting. Sure. Because all this was fairly new. Mm. And it was like, I think it unplugged something, as I mentioned, maybe a past life experience. Maybe I was a monk in a past life, or mm. at least had contact with the Dhamma. And was, hearing these things, it was, you know, something was kind of shaken loose inside and wanted to come out and make mm. contact. But it just took, you know, the skillful teachings of the Lama and the whole the situation of that course, it was a very exotic place, you know, and, mm -hmm. and so on. It's a beautiful image to, you know, for me to think about you and your youth coming outside, looking up at the, at the stars and, you know, feeling like some real transformation had occurred. Yeah, I mean, that euphoria wore, wore off, sure. you know, after some days, but uh, the, the, the desire to learn more didn't go off. Sure. Um, was there, did you feel that there was like any immediate insight from that experience that you would explain or was it more just the... The insight that I've been ignorant my whole life, that was the insight. That was the insight. Mm. Whatever it was. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and you talk about becoming a monk, did that happen in Sri Lanka or...? Yes. The first stage of my monk, yeah, becoming a novice monk. I see. In 1975. And um, I'm curious if you'd want to share any words to someone out there who's maybe considering becoming a monk. Uh, well, you know, times are different now. And, you know, there's plenty of places where people can learn Dhamma and monasteries where one could go. And then, you know, depending on you know, the particular monastery, you have to spend time, you know, uh, you know, in the monastery or the temple, you know, and you have to get to know the monks and they, you know, see your your behavior, your character, and usually you have to wait some time and, you know, doing service to the to the center and so on. And then at some point it's up to the head of that temple or center, the teacher, to decide whether, uh, you know, to have you ordained or if they have the ability to do that or they might recommend you going to Sri Lanka or Thailand or someplace else and getting ordained over there. Mm. So, is it, so every person's uh, case is unique. Mm. But here at least there is the chance for to get ordained in you know, a number of different places here in, in America, whereas in my day it wasn't. Mm. And how important do you feel ordination is versus staying a lay practitioner on the path? Well, it provides the the environment to focus most of your time on practice or studying the Dhamma. Where lay life, you get pulled in different directions, especially if you get caught up in family and relationships and and, and job and having to earn money and, and so on. So all that 
dilutes the, the mind's power to, you know, spend more time mm. focusing on uh, learning and uh, meditating. Mm. And what do you remember about the day of your uh, ordination? Uh, well, I have a, a photo taken just, you know, like 30 minutes after I put on the robe in Sri Lanka and I had a super big grin on my face. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I'd love to see that photo sometime. Um, that sounds great. Thank you so much for watching. And if you want to learn more and get some free resources, check out my website, meditatewithranga.com.